The Mystical Evolution in the Development and Vitality of the Church Part 14 Appendix 1. True Union with Christ and the Folly of Love Speaking of the prayer of union in its early stages, before it becomes fused with the prayer of quiet, St. Teresa says, This state is a sleep of the faculties, which are neither wholly lost nor yet can understand how they work. The pleasure and sweetness and delight are incomparably greater than in the previous state. For the water of grace rises to the very neck of the soul, so that it is unable to go forward and has no idea how to do so. Yet neither can it turn back. It would fain have the fruition of exceedingly greater glory. This seems to me to be nothing less than, and, than all but complete death to everything of the world and a fruition of God. I know no other terms in which to describe it or explain it, nor does the soul at such a time know what to do. It knows not whether to speak or to be silent, whether to laugh or to weep. This state is a glorious folly, a heavenly madness, in which the true wisdom is acquired, and a mode of fruition which the soul finds the greatest delight. The faculties retain only the power of occupying themselves wholly with God. Not one of them, it seems, ventures to stir, nor can we cause any of them to move except by trying to fix our attention very carefully on something else. And even then, I do not think we could entirely succeed in doing so. Many words are spoken during this state in praise of God, but unless the Lord himself puts order into them, they have no orderly form. The understanding, at any rate, counts for nothing here. The soul would like to shout praises aloud, for it is in such a state that it cannot contain itself a state of delectable disquiet. Already the flowers are opening. See, they are beginning to send out their fragrance. The soul would like everyone to see her now, become aware of her glory, to praise of God, and to help her sing her praises. O oh God, what must that soul be like when it is in this state? It would fain be all tongue, so that it might praise the Lord, it utters a thousand holy follies, striving ever to please him who thus possesses it. What torments could have been set before her at such a time when they would not have found it delectable to endure for her Lord's sake? She sees clearly that, when the martyrs suffered their torments, they did hardly anything of themselves, for the soul is well aware that fortitude comes from somewhere outside itself. But what will the soul experience when it regains its senses and goes back to live in the world, and has to return to the world's preoccupations and formalities? Oh, what great freedom we enjoy! It makes us look upon having to live and act according to the laws of the world as captivity. In any one of these visits, brief as its duration may be, the gardener gives the soul water without limit and that poor soul could not acquire, even if it labored and fatigued its understanding, for as much as twenty years this heavenly gardener achieves in a moment. The virtues, then, are now stronger than they were previously in the prayer of quiet, for the soul sees that it is other than it was, and does not realize how it is beginning to do great things with the fragrance that is being given forth by the flowers. It is the Lord's will that these shall open, so the soul may see that it possesses virtue. The humility, too, which remains in the soul is much greater and deeper than it was previously, for it sees more clearly that it has done nothing at all of itself, save to consent that the Lord shall grant its favors and to receive them with its will. This kind of prayer, I think, is quite definitely a union of the entire soul with God 
except that his majesty appears to be willing to give the faculties leave to understand and have fruition of the great things that he is now doing. Writing to Father Rodrigo Alvarez, St. Teresa, in Spiritual Relations, 4, says of the ecstatic union, Where there is union of all the faculties, the position is quite different. They can then do nothing, for the understanding is, as it were, dazed. The love of the will is stronger than the understanding, but the understanding does not know if the will loves or what it is doing in such a way as to be able to speak of it. As to the memory, my belief is that the soul has none and cannot think at all. The senses, too, in my opinion, are no longer awake, but are, as it were, lost, so that the soul may be more fully occupied in fruition. Alvarez de Paz, De Grad Contemplat, Part 3, Chapter 5. This union is a precious gift whereby God manifests himself as present in the very center and core of the soul by means of a most clear light and shows himself a most tender lover. In this union, the memory tenaciously adheres to God thus manifested. The intellect gazes upon him in the most clear light of wisdom so that it is unable to be diverted from him to anything else. The will embraces him with a most ardent love and, like a fierce fire, seems to consume all things so that the soul no longer lives in itself nor performs any natural actions, but transfers all its attention to the tender spouse who holds it in close embrace. In this state, the soul does not act, but it receives. It does not progress, but is carried along by force, and, without waiting for its consent, although its consent is given, it is led into the chamber of incredible delight. The soul does not discourse and love. Rather, it finds in itself a remarkable intuition and an ardent love of God, yet the soul does not lose its own being in him but re receives a new being which quickly absorbs the natural being. This union has two characteristics. The first and principal one is the love with which God loves his spouse and is ardently loved by her, and to such an extent that the spouse swoons with love. The second and less important characteristics is an internal sweetness, which fills all the powers of the soul and absorbs by its attention and desires. Thus does the soul feel itself taken up by God and given the aids of his grace, and a most perfect love whereby it is made like to him in the purity of its life. From this can be understood the words, quote, I am the vine, you the branches, unquote. And also the words, he that abideth in me and I in him, and the same beareth much fruit. Therefore, whatever of the spiritual and divine is found in man, it must be separated by a vivifying love from all that is earthly and corpor corporeal. In this way a division is made between spirit and mind, that is, between the spirituality and animality or sensuality. The precious is separated from the vile. Since God is spirit, and since likeness is the cause of union, it is evident why a spirit thus cleansed is united to the divine spirit. 2. Effects of the Ecstatic Union St. Teresa says that after this type of prayer, the soul is left so full of courage that it would be greatly comforted if at that moment, for God's sake, it could be hacked to pieces. It is then that it makes heroic resolutions and promises that it desires to become full of vigor, that it begins to abhor the world, and that it develops the clearest realization of its own vanity. The benefits that it receives are more numerous and sublime than any which proceed from the previous states of prayer. 
and its humility is also greater, for it clearly sees how, by no effort of its own, it would either gain or keep so exceedingly and so great a favor. It also sees clearly how extremely unworthy it is, for in a room bathed in sunlight not a cobweb can remain hidden. It sees its own wretchedness. So far is vainglory from it that it cannot believe it could ever be guilty of such a thing. For now it sees with its own eyes that of itself it can do little or nothing. The soul realizes that it has deserved to go to hell, yet its punishment is to taste glory. It becomes consumed in praises of God as I would fain now become. It begins to show signs of being a soul that is guarding the treasures of heaven and to be desirous of sharing them with others and to beseech God that it may not be alone in its riches. Almost without knowing it and doing nothing consciously to that end, it begins to benefit its neighbors. And they become aware of this benefit because the flowers have so, now so powerful a fragrance as to make them desire to approach them. They realize that the soul has virtues, and, seeing how desirable the fruit is, it would fain help to partake of it. Blessed Angela of Foligno The soul receives the gift of loving God and divine things with a love similar to the absolutely true love which God has loved us. It feels that the immense God is within it, keeping it company, it perceives him in its very core, without any corporal form, but more clearly than one man sees another. The eyes of the soul witness a spiritual plenitude which has nothing of the body about it, but which is, it is impossible to say anything because both words and the imagination fail. In this marvelous union, which instantaneously renews the soul and makes the body docile, the soul acquires a certitude that the Lord is truly present to it, for there is no saint or angel that could perform the things that are effected in the soul. So ineffable are these operations that I feel a keen regret at not being able to say anything that is worthy of them. God embraces the soul as no father or mother have ever embraced their child. Truly, the embrace wherewith Jesus Christ unites himself to the soul is indescribable. No worldly man could ever speak this secret or even believe it. Jesus brings to the soul a most tender love by which it is entirely inflamed. He brings to it a light so brilliant that the soul, feeling within itself plenitude of the goodness of the omnipotent God, is able to understand infinitely more than it is aware of. At that time, the soul has a proof and a certainty that Jesus Christ dwells within it. 3. Excellency of this state. Blosius, Speculum Spirit, 11. It is a wonderful thing to arrive at the exile of mystical union with God, the soul, pure, humble, resigned, and inflamed with an ardent charity, is raised above itself and, amid the resplendent clarity of the divine light which shines forth in its mind, it loses all consideration for divine light which shines forth in its mind. To lo it loses all consideration for and distinction of things, totally enraptured with love and, as it were, annihilated. It chooses itself in God. Without any intermediary, the soul is joined to him, becomes one in spirit with him, and is transformed in him. As iron placed in the fire becomes fire without ceasing to be iron, so the soul becomes one with God, but not in such wise that it becomes the same substance in nature as he is. Here the soul is at rest, ceasing its own activities in order to receive the divine activity with unspeakable peace and joy. 
So great is the delight which the soul enjoys, that it seems to it that heaven and earth and all things therein have melted away and vanished. This is the unity and simplicity where God dwells. Having found the eternal word, the soul possesses also his immeasurable riches. Blessed is the soul that it raised above all created things and even its own activity, whose memory is stripped of all sorts of images and experiences simple purity. Its mind perceives the most brilliant irradations of the sun of justice and knows the divine truth. Its will experiences the fire of a tranquil love, the contact of the Holy Ghost, which, like a living fountain, gushes forth in streams of eternal sweetness. Thus is the soul introduced to sublime union with God. But souls that are admitted to this union should return to their own proper activity. Once the divine operation ceases, they should return to their holy meditations, good works, and ordinary exercises, seeking to keep themselves humble, persisting in the desire for spiritual progress and conducting themselves in all things, as if they were to begin a better life. Says the same author, When the human spirit receives this mystical wisdom in the divine union, and is illumined by eternal truth, its faith is verified, its hope is strengthened, and its charity is further inflamed. Therefore, if all the wise men of the world should say to one who has experienced this union, quote, you deceive yourself, unhappy soul, for your faith is untrue, unquote. The soul would intrepidly reply, quote, it is you who are deceived. I have complete certitude as to the truth of my faith, unquote. Indeed, the soul knows the divinity better than all the great masters, if they themselves have not yet been admitted to the Holy of Holies, and into the secret chamber of the eternal king. God reveals to such souls the truths of the scriptures, and he gives them a taste for the gospels. Since they possess true wisdom, more thorough the inspiration of the ghost than by reading of many books, they see clearly and know for certain what must be done or omitted. 4. Perfect Union and Disinterested Love Sister Barbara wrote, How clearly everything can be seen when God comes to the soul. I say this because it seems to me that I feel my God within my soul. He is so closely united to it, to him, that I no longer possess my soul, but it is rather he who possesses it. Whether others speak to me or not, whether they treat me well or ill, God now possesses me, both in tribulation and in consolation. I now have no desire for anything, for I have no other desire than that of my God. I know not how to explain myself, but I feel that God is very close to me. I feel him as if he were within my very soul and my heart faints away with longings to love him. These longings are not f for any desire of glory. They are purely for God. Therefore, even if there were no heaven, I would love him just the same, because I love him in a disinterested manner. If I were to know that I could serve his greater glory by suffering all the pains of hell for eternity, my soul loves him so intensely that it would be content to do that, just so my God might have the greater glory. Yet I know well that my God does not desire that, but I say it because I have a desire to suffer much for God, and this desire is so strong that everything else seems little to me. This is the disinterested love which seeks good for the sake of good, and not for any selfish aims. This love is not to be thought of as that which was invented by Kant and proclaimed by Seneca, for the very ones who vainly proposed a morality without sanction did not even know how to fulfill it with sanctions. Not possessing the truth, they could not know what the true 
good, the plenitude of desirable being. Those who are perfect and whose eyes of the heart have been illumined by the ardent charity which casts out fear know the only true and complete good. They see that it deserves to be loved for itself and not for any other motives, that it should be preferred above all other goods, even if there were no sanctions. Yet sanctions are indispensable for the imperfect, who are always in the majority and who practice good with the help of the law of fear, which no longer rules the perfect. Quote, the law is ma not made for the just man, but for the unjust and disobedient. Unquote. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. Quote, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Unquote. Galatians chapter 5, verse 18. St. Bernard, Sermon 83 in Canticles, Numbers 4 or 5. God asks to be feared as Lord, honored as Father, and loved as Spouse. Love is a great thing, but it admits of various grades or degrees, and the supreme grade is that of the Spouse. This love is sufficient to itself, and it has within itself its own merit and reward. The sons love also, but they think in terms of the heritage and are fearful of losing it. I suspect that this type of love is one that must be supported by the hope of further goods. Pure love, on the other hand, desires nothing, for it is not a mercenary love. Such is the love of a spouse, for she is what she is solely because of love. All her hope and all her good lies in love. Then St. Bernard proceeds to describe the love of a mature son who is nourished by solid food, great works, and does not engage in the doings of children, the consolations enjoyed by imperfect souls, but long for the heavenly heritage on which his thoughts are continually centered. The saint adds, quote, but there is yet another love more sublime than this love of a son, and this type of love seeks and desires not but God alone, for the heart is now totally purified. The soul now seeks nothing of its own, neither its own happiness, its own glory, or anything at all by reason of any special love of itself. It dedicates itself completely to God in order to adhere to him, possess him, and find delight in him. Unquote. Chapter 5 The Deifying Transforming Union In spite of the longings of the soul, which, quote, dies because it does not die, unquote, the divine spouse desires that the beloved should for a time continue to suffer, love, and progress in charity. This will continue until he has made it a living image and faithful reproduction of himself, so that in his name and by his power the soul will carry on the mission which he himself had on this earth. The Mystical Espousal To this end, after he has purified, beautified, and disposed the soul, as we shall soon see, he celebrates with it the mystical espousal by means of a formal and solemn pact. He gives the soul the symbolic ring, or effects an exchange of hearts, saying, as he did to St. Catherine of Siena, quote, Be mindful of me, and I shall be mindful of thee. Unquote. Or to St. Teresa, quote, Henceforth, as my true spouse, you will be attentive to my honor, unquote. or to St. Rose of Lima, quote, Rose of my heart, be thou my spouse. Unquote. He commands such souls to treat him with confidence and love, and always to call him by the most sweet name of spouse. Before celebrating this pact, 
God is accustomed many times to manifest himself to the soul in all the splendor of his glorified humanity. He does this to impress the soul with his goodness and beauty, so that, knowing the good which is promised, it will be inflamed with an ardent desire to possess him as soon as possible. These manifestations are sometimes repeated at frequent intervals, and over a long period of time until the soul is properly prepared for the espousal. Thus, also, the soul is comforted in the midst of terrible trials by which its fidelity must yet be tried before it can enter fully into that grade of prayer which is so eminent that it is actually the beginning of a life which is totally divine. The words of the espousal are usually of themselves efficacious, or, as St. John of the Cross says, substantial, because like the fiat of the Creator, they produce the effect which they express. With the pronouncing of these words, the soul finds itself uh, transformed. It is now no longer what it was previously. All its aims have been changed and have become so divine that no interest is left in the soul. All its interest now lies in the glory of God, the prosperity of the church, and the welfare of souls. It pays no heed to its own interests, for it has placed them in the hands of the sweet master, and he is charged to care for the soul and see that it is not bothered by the interests while engaged in his divine service. Thus all self-regard ceases, and the soul is concerned only with loving, pleasing, and serving its divine spouse as best it can. Even the ardent desire which the soul formerly had, to die so that it might go to him and find enjoyment in him, and thereby avoid all danger of offending him, even that desire comes to an end. The soul is inebriated with love. It seeks only to work and to suffer as much as possible for the glory of God and the good of souls, even if it means the deprivation of all consolation. Suffering, which formerly caused great dismay, has now been changed into something of vital necessity. The soul cannot and cares not to live without suffering for the, glor for the glory of its beloved. Because of the love now animating it, the soul considers insipid and intolerable any life which is not, like his, filled with privations and pains. The soul is not ignorant of the fact that, like him, it must live as a victim of expiation and propitiation. If its own salvation preoccupies its soul, it is not out of self-interest but pure divine love which constrains the soul to seek union with its God. If it were God's pleasure that the soul should suffer the pains of hell for the good of some other soul, and if in doing so it could continue to love and serve God, it would offer itself gladly, as did St. Paul and St. Catherine, who desired to be anathematized by Christ for the good of their brethren. The valor of such souls surpasses all heroism. Once, when St. Catherine of Siena was in imminent danger of shipwreck, she noticed that her confessor, Blessed Raymond of Capua, was terrified, as were all the members of the crew. Turning to Raymond, she said, quote, Father, why are you so frightened? What difference should this make to you? We have no interest but those of God and his church. He will take care of us. Unquote. God actually did so, and they were delivered from that danger. The disinterestedness of these generous souls extends even to their prayer and divine collo colloquies, and it costs them dearly to abandon them. For they have found that there is such sweet consolation and such great progress. But when the spouse calls them to sacrifice themselves for him, they do not answer, quote, I have put off my garment, how shall I put it on? I have washed my feet, how shall I defile them? Unquote. Rather, if the good of a soul demands it, they immediately 
discreetly and without complaint abandon the flowery couch of prayer and divine consolations. They leave the pleasant repose of Mary for the efficient activity of Martha. But they are not at all perturbed, as was Martha herself. For in the midst of a prodigious external activity, internally they remain tranquil and recollected conversing with God in their hearts so that they were all alone. There is no danger that they would soil their feet with the dust of earth or be contaminated by a worldly atmosphere. Rather, they sanctify the ground which they tread, and they purify and perfume the air with the virtue which they exhale. So it was with St. Catherine of Siena, St. Philip Neri, St. Teresa of Avila, and so many other great saints who, at the end of their life, found it necessary to sacrifice their long hours of contemplation for activity. They lost nothing on that account, but they made great progress in charity and the same time helped countless souls. It is not to be wondered that, to pass from simple union to such a divine state, They should have had to pass through great trials and tribulations, dying again and again to themselves in order to live with Jesus Christ in God. Although the union of the mystical espousal is so wonderful and continual, it is not yet absolutely stable or indissoluble. There as yet remains for the soul long periods of absence, obscurities, and desolations, and these are all the more painful as the soul's love is more ardent and its longings for complete transformation are more keen. Moreover, the soul can still fall into serious danger, which makes it necessary for it to keep a close watch over itself and to proceed with caution, lest it expose itself to the loss of all its good and final and permanent abandonment. That this union be strengthened and become so intimate and indissoluble that the soul attains full certainty of never being more disturbed, new proofs of fidelity and love are required. The soul must be subjected to further tests and purgations which are more painful than anything previously experienced. However pure, simple, and holy the soul may appear in its sweet union of conformity with God, it is still incredibly far removed from the purity, rectitude, simplicity, and sanctity which are necessary for this other union with God, which is so intimate, perfect, and stable, that God becomes the soul's all in all, and the soul is completely lost to itself and transformed in him. These purgations will erase the last vestiges of the earthly man and change the soul of an angel in human form. Then the soul can say in all truth that it and God are two in one spirit. Without realizing it, the soul is filled with the remnants or traces of hidden imperfections. If these were seen by the soul, they would fill it with confusion and chagrin. There remains also a subtle self-love, which is all the more harmful because it is spiritual and dissimulated, and is taken for a holy love. Amid the soul's sighs and longings for God, and even in the raptures of divine love, the soul still seeks something of self, and heeds its particular aims and intentions. It yet possesses a certain amount of attachment to spiritual consolations, thinking of self, and paying too much attention to the spiritual gifts, and with the results that it is something forgets the giver of those gifts. God demands that he be sought solely for what he is, and not for any other motive. Therefore, he requires that the soul should forget every creative thing, however holy it may be, and however necessary, so that the soul may adhere simply to the uncreated essence. In this way can the soul be wed to the word of wisdom. To this end, God assails the soul with a sharp and penetrating sight, which illumines the most hidden folds of the heart, and brings to light many of its many imperfections. By means of such a light, the soul learns to know itself and 
knowing itself, it knows himself also. It knows what things it must value and what things it must cast aside, purify or rectify. So keen is this light that it dazzles and stupefies the soul. It strikes like a thunderbolt and leaves it buried in the most frightful darkness. And during this darkness, the soul experiences its complete renewal. It is configured with Christ, and amid great anguish it receives the impress of his divine and living seal. In that state of darkness, the soul must follow him in his passion, death and burial, so that ultimately it will rise again with him, totally transfigured with a life that is entirely new. The soul will not be united to him, but will be transformed and made one with him. When this union shall have been consummated and ratified by the mystical marriage, the soul will see clearly that God has taken possession of its whole being as a new vital principle, which renews and divinizes it, and that it is he who works and lives in the soul. To this are ordained all the terrible purgations and mystical operations of the obscure and prolonged night of the spirit, which we shall speak of later because it is more intense after the espousal, although it begins to be experienced much earlier, during the prayer of union. That this union may be changed from the conforming union to the transforming union. God himself must work in the soul in a manner that is hidden, mysterious, and painful. He rids the soul of all sensible delights which it experienced in the former union, wherein the delight of the spirit redounded to the senses. God seems to hide himself, but now actually he is much more intimately united to the soul. The soul is amazed at the change it now experiences. It believes itself to be abandoned, yet it finds that it is improved in every way. The change is most profitable, but the soul is unable to understand how this can be so. At times, the soul experiences God's delicate touch or that most subtle divine contact with, on renewal, renewing, the, sp the soul produces in it great flights of love. But though these things are very ardent and cause intense pain, they are not carried over to the sensible order, nor do they cause the slightest change in the countenance of the person in whom they take place. All this is a great interior violence which wounds even to the death in order to destroy all human imperfections, but outwardly the person remains collected in an unchanging peace. Therefore, the flights of the spirit are seldom perceptible externally, although their efficacy is compar incomparably exceeds those which were formerly experienced, and which caused the soul to break forth in size and other exterior manifestations. In the formidable spiritual darkness, wherein the soul is buried in its mystical cocoon, and is incapacitated for working by itself, or for possessing any initiative at all, it believes itself to be imprisoned or buried in hell itself, Nevertheless, it is gradually undergoing the mysterious change from the conforming to the transforming union, although the soul itself is scarcely aware of it. It notes only that all sensible communications have vanished as well as the great delight of union, which is formerly experience, and it hardly realizes what is happening until the whole transformation has taken place. In losing the consolations of the former union, and in receiving the spiritual light, which is so dazzling that it appears to be utter blackness, and the cauterizing fire which does not touch the sensible order, the soul experiences a sort of martyrdom. Yet all this is the working of pure love, and these effects are so much loved by the soul that, if it is insufficiently animated and faithful, it will not wish them to disappear, but to be increased and prolonged. The reason for this is that the soul, without knowing how, realizes that it is thereby receives new life, new strength, and new desires which have nothing worldly 
or selfish about them. The soul marvels at seeing itself so changed, so spiritualized, so renewed and enriched, that it had thought itself miserably lost. In this mystical death the soul has found life, and in every one of its various sufferings it sees the loving touch of the divine artist, who is sculpting the soul to his own taste in order to make it entirely like himself. The soul has abandoned itself blindly to the hands of God and joyfully resigned itself to let God work in it and make use of it what he will. But at the same time it sees with great pain that it is despoiled of self and all its affections, desires, interests, and human manner of working. In the measure that the soul is purified and renewed, it, it is able to distinguish better those delicate rays of heavenly light by which it can know the divine mysteries. The same light makes the soul suffer greatly with painful longings because the more it fills the soul with the loving knowledge of God, the more empty does the soul seem to be. The reason for this is that the soul sees what it, it what it knows as nothing when compared with what yet remains to be known. The soul deems it impossible ever to, to the sound the depths of that adorable abyss which so enchants, attracts, and captivates it. Although such souls do not advert very often to the mysterious work being effected in them, or do not dare to give an account of what they are experiencing, Whenever God wills that they explain it, how it is he himself is doing this to them, and he suggests to them the proper words by which they are able to speak of such things incomparably better than any speculative theologian. At other times, in order to better understand the more clearly explain the marvelous interior renewal which the souls perceive in an intellectual vision, the transformation is the same uh, is at the same time symbolized for them in an imaginative vision which manifests in their heart what is being affected invisibly and mystically to the core of their soul. That is how so many souls see that the Lord is carrying them off, changing them, inflaming them, and purifying their heart. They understand very well the mystery of the operation, which is as painful as it is delightful. Thus is verified the obscure and prolonged interior activity which renews souls that are enjoying union with God and disposes them for the mystical espousal. Later it leads them gradually to the total transformation which is required for the mystical marriage, during the preparatory renewal, amid the great raptures and flights of the soul in the midst of its sufferings, those colloquies occur which precede the celebration of the marriage, in which the soul receives new strength that it may subject itself willingly to whatever works the Divine Spirit may wish to realize in it. The painful darkness is intermittently broken with an indescribable scribable lights and consolations. Better to say that this mystical night is a continuous and marvelous illumination in which clarity, ardor, and joy increase in proportion to the apparent darkness, desolation, and pain. Thus the soul disposed and adorned with the divine fineries necessary to make it a worthy spouse of the word. In this way, the soul becomes one with him, although the full communication of his spirit and that happy union is consolidated and confirmed by an irrevocable pact. But since the pact of the mystical marriage demands that the renewal should be complete, before we pass on to speak of the marriage itself, we shall attempt, with the help of those souls that actually experience these things, to give some idea however remote, of the mystical night wherein these mysteries take place. We shall speak also of the bitter pains which the privileged and heroic servants of God have to suffer for a long time, 
All this is necessary for souls, if, while yet on earth, we are to reach a perfect configuration with Christ and enjoy in a stable manner the first fruits of glory. Appendix 1. The Divine Espousal Interior Castle, Fifth Mansions, Chapter 4 All giving and taking have now come to an end, and in a secret way the soul sees who this spouse is that she is to take. By means of the senses and faculties she could not understand in a thousand years what she understands in this way in the briefest space of time. But the spouse, being who he is, leaves her, after that one visit, worthier to join hands, as people say, with him. And the soul becomes so fired with love that for her part she does her utmost not to thwart this divine betrothal. If she is neglectful, however, and sets her affection on anything other than himself, she loses everything, and that is a loss every bit as great as are her the favors she has been granting her, which are far greater than it is possible to convey. So, Christian souls, whom the Lord has brought to this point on your journey, I beseech you, for his sake, not to be negligent, but to withdraw from occasions of sin. For even in this state the soul is not strong enough to be able to run into them safely, as it is after the betrothal has been made, that is to say, in the mansion which we shall describe after this one. For this communication has been no more than, as we might say, one single short meeting, and the devil will take great pains about combating it and will try to hinder the betrothal. Afterwards, when he sees that the soul is completely surrendered to the spouse, he dare not do this, for he is afraid of such a soul that he knows by experience that if he attempts anything of the kind he will come out very much the loser, and the soul will achieve a corresponding gain. 2. The Exchange of Hearts Says Father Weiss, the exchange of hearts is a common phenomena in the lives of the saints. Often it was outwardly manifested in a wonderful manner, as we read in the lives of St. Catherine of Siena, St. Catherine de Ricci, St. Lutgard, and others. But in all saints it was, to some extent, verified internally. Hence many things in their lives are incomprehensible, for the exterior is the expression of the interior. 3. Impulses and Wounds of the Spirit The Interior Castle, Sixth Mansions, Chapter 2 Before the soul is wholly united with him, the spouse fills it with fervent desire, by means so delicate that the soul itself does not understand them, nor do I think I shall succeed in describing them in such a way as to be understood, except by those who have experienced it, for these are influences so delicate and subtle that they proceed from the very depth of the heart, and I know no comparison that I can make which f will fit the case. All this is very different from what one can achieve in earthly manners, and even from consolations which have been described. For often, when a person is quite unprepared for such a thing, and is not even thinking of God, he is awakened by his majesty, although by a rushing comment or a thunderclap. Although no sound is heard, the soul is very well aware that it had been called by God, so much so that sometimes, especially at first, it begins to tremble and complain, though it feels nothing that causes it affliction. It is conscious of having been most delectably wounded, but it cannot say how or by whom. But it is certain that this is a precious experience, and it would be glad if it were never to be healed of that wound. It complains to the spouse with words of love, even cries aloud, being unable to help itself, 
for it realizes that he is present but will not manifest himself in such a way as to allow it to enjoy him, and this is a great grief. Although a sweet and delectable one, even if it should desire not to suffer it, it would have no choice. But in any case it would never so desire. It is much more satisfying to a soul than is the delectable absorption, devoid of distress, which occurs in the prayer of quiet. So powerful is the effect of, of this upon the soul that it becomes consumed with desire, yet cannot think what to ask, so clearly conscious it is of the presence of God. Now, if this is so, you will ask me what it desires or what causes its distress. What greater blessing can it wish for? I cannot say. I know that this distress seems to penetrate its very bowels, and that when he that has wounded it draws out the arrow, the bowels seem to come with it, so deeply it feels this love. Here all the senses and faculties are active, and there is no absorption. They are on the alert to discover what can be happening, and, so far as I can see, they cause no disturbance, and can neither increase this delectable pain or remove it. Anyone to whom our Lord has granted this favor will recognize the fact on reading this, and he must give him most heartfelt thanks and must not fear that it may be a deception, and let his chief fear be rather lest he show ingratitude so for so great a favor, and let him endeavor to serve God and to grow better all his life long, and he will see the result of this and find himself receiving more and more. It may be that you wonder why greater security can be felt about this than many other things. For the following reasons, I think. First, because so delectable a pain can never be bestowed upon the soul by the devil. He can give pleasures and delights which seem to be spiritual, but it is beyond his power to unite pain with tranquility and joy in the soul. For all his powers are in the external sphere, and when he causes pain, it is never, to my mind, delectable or peaceful, but restless and combative. Secondly, this delectable tempest comes from another region than those who have, with which he has authority, Thirdly, the great advantages accrue to the soul, which, as a general rule, becomes filled with determination to suffer for God's sake, and to desire to have many trials to endure, and to be much more resolute in the withdrawing from the pleasures and intercourse of this world, and other things like them.' 